Welcome to the Spotlight series. Don't just survive, thrive. Most of us have experienced challenging times now more than ever. The key is how we choose to respond, whether we merely survive or thrive. My name is Nicola Steele, founder of JJP Talent Solutions, an Australian IT recruitment company. With over 20 years expertise, I provide insights on how you can transform your career to the next level. However, we are not just our careers. We are spouses, partners, parents, friends, etc., with a variety of needs and wants. In this podcast, I talk to a diverse range of experts from different professions, such as finance, law, psychology, and health, to provide insights on how you can survive and thrive. I don't have all the answers. However, collectively, we can instill hope, clarity, and inspiration. I hope you enjoy listening. I am delighted to introduce Kerry Jury. Kerry is the CEO of Advancer, a virtual HR company which is on a mission to help businesses get HR confident. She has over 20 years experience of people development, HR and change management experience. Kerry, thank you for joining me on episode nine of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Excellent. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, Kerry, please could you tell me more about yourself and what you do? Um, So, my background is that I came over to Australia from the UK in 99. Um, I've worked in HR in one way or another since I arrived here. With my most recent sort of big job being in um, Queensland Health as the Executive Director and Workforce and Organisational Development for Metro North Hospital and Health Service. Um, And after having a couple of big jobs (laughs) in health that were impacting on family and uh, and other things, I decided to leave that environment and start um, my own business where I could um, help predominantly small to medium businesses, but also larger businesses. Um, with their HR needs. Perfect and that's how Advancer was born I believe. It absolutely was Uh, and Advancer has um, the vision or the the desire I suppose to increase capability and capacity within businesses so that they actually reduce their reliance on consultants such as myself doing myself out of a job essentially. So With regards to Advancer, tell me, how does it blend tech and HR consultancy services? So one arm of of, uh, Advancer is Advancer.ai, which is a machine learning and ultimately will be um, uh, an artificial intelligence sort of type system, um, which uh, can virtually be sent out, or not virtually, can be sent out to uh, clients where they can look through their HR compliance and best practice HR management processes online. They enter, they answer a number of questions and and rate themselves and they get a report um, that shows them where their risks might be in terms of their HR compliance and, and how well they're doing in that HR space. Then, of course, through the HR services is if any of them need any help to develop things like policies, um, improve contracts, um, get some team development, leadership development, all of those sorts of things, then we can absolutely step in and and work with them um, to give them the support and resources that they need. Uh, And we find this is particularly useful to those um, businesses who don't have on-site HR um, and who can't afford to have on-site HR, full-time HR. They can do a lot of this themselves. Therefore, someone can learn in their business on what's actually required. Um, And they just need almost sort of a mentor or a coach sitting outside in the form of of one of our consultants to, to help them along. And it basically gives them this comfort that they are actually compliant and they do actually have some good HR practices in there to make them, you know, uh, um, uh, an employer that people will want to work with, essentially becoming HR confident. Perfect. So in terms of the type of clients that you work with, what kind of clients uh, does Advancer uh, help and make them HR confident? Yeah. So, so I've worked with, um, I've gone back into health and worked with them. I've gone into pharmaceutical companies. I've gone into other local government um, agencies. Those sort of people have been le- needing strategic planning, workforce planning, 
you know, what does our workforce need to look like, et cetera. But I've also worked with some um, small to medium businesses who are looking at really getting their teams to be very productive, high performing, and and looking at how actually they end up uh, communicating with each other, holding themselves accountable, holding each other accountable, and creating a culture where that is actually something that is um, embraced and embedded into the organization rather than feared, you know, having a difficult conversation with someone, for example, around performance is less intimidating if you've already got a um, an agreed to framework around which you can do it. So on the subject of high performing teams, how can companies really create high performing teams in the current crisis that we have at the moment? And then on the other side of that as well? Do you know that the key to high performing teams really is to establish where everybody's strengths and weaknesses lie in the team. Um, You can have a group of people essentially performing exactly the same day to day tasks and each of them will have a different strength and an associated weakness. And and some of those weaknesses are going to be allowable and some of them aren't. Um, And some people will, you know, uh, rile each other up, whereas some people won't. And really understanding that in terms of um, and having those conversations around, um, you know, what, what makes people tick and what really makes them thrive, I suppose can be absolutely key to for organizations to organize their work and, um, you know, make sure that people are actually playing to their strengths. So in terms of diversity, but also complementing strengths and, and weaknesses. Absolutely. So um, one of the ones that I've used quite recently with um, with a team, they were all uh, software engineers. There are a number of people who are rather introverted. They did... Um, didn't really get their energy from their peers. They really got it from themselves. Um, and we ran through um, a team role personality, or it was not a personality, a team role behavioral test um, called Belbin, which um, identifies nine different team roles. And we identified where they all sat on the continuum around these nine different roles. We established where their strengths were and where as a team they actually had real gaps. So, for example, they were really great at developing their uh, startup business. They were great at developing their product, but they had nobody out there marketing and nobody out there selling, which is problematic <laughs> when you're trying to um, when you're trying to launch something on, on a new um, audience. It enabled them to go out and um, recruit to the gap that they they saw, uh, but also they understood where their strengths and weaknesses were. So they could also, um, they thought they might have to recruit two people. They actually only needed to recruit one because they could rejig what was going on in their in their existing team, which was a terrific outcome for them, saved them yeah, thousands. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. And in terms of, we're in a really unique situation at the moment. So in terms of high-performing teams, do the same rules apply where we are now, uh, working from home, et cetera? It's, uh, it's, it's really tough um, for some individuals working from home at the moment. There, there are memes around the internet all over the place at the moment, you know, with the introverts saying, yes, I've been um, training for this my whole life. Um, and then you've got, you know, the other ones saying, hey, introverts, check on your extroverted mates. They're not doing OK. They don't know how this works. And that that is exceptionally true. Um, so it requires a little bit more consideration with, with where we are at the moment. Um, introverted, um, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but introverted um, team members potentially could drop off the Zoom meetings much easier, not participate, because of course, then they don't get their energy from participating in, in those sorts of activities. And extroverts will be frantically pacing the room because they're stuck by themselves, um, maybe researching or writing a paper, and they can't necessarily talk to people face to face with it. Not having this engagement with, indiv- with other people for an extrovert will make them exhausted at the end of the day. I currently live with three extroverts. I'm not introverted myself, but um, three extroverts, and they are all exhausted by the end of the day. They can't understand why, because they've been getting up later. They haven't got their commute. They're not doing, you know, various things. But the the reason is, is because they're not having that social interaction. They're not getting that um, energy from their peers. So high performance teams in this environment requires a lot of consideration of how to actually get the most out of each of those, if we're talking Belbin, those team roles, if you're talking just mm-hmm. the typical introvert and extrovert, those. Um, and, and good managers will be will be hopefully maximizing how that 
that actually works for their team. Which is really interesting that the extroverts are getting drained mm. by not going out and about, yeah. to gather that energy from other people. Yeah, um, that's it. And I mean, look, there is Zoom, but I think Zoom is is fast becoming, I don't know, um, not, not as popular as it might well have been at the very beginning. I think the shine's wearing off it <laughs> now. Absolutely. Um, the novelties, I know um, from work, we were using it a lot, but also socially. It was all yeah. very exciting on a Saturday night doing house party, but now yeah. it's a bit, yeah. oh, do we have to do that? <laughs> that's it. That's, it. that's exactly right. And, and really what this is showing is that, um, yes, online is, is important, um, but there's for, for an extrovert anyway, there is nothing better than that physical interaction. As I said, the introverts are probably loving life. You know, they... Um, I, and as I said, gross generalization, sweeping generalization. But um, but you know that they, they they just draw their energy from a different source than than the extroverts. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Um, which brings me on quite nicely to um, another initiative that you've got called Socially. Yes. So tell me a bit more about that and how it's solving the the problems of social isolation and and what have yeah. you. Well, look, social isolation has, is nothing new, really. Um, it just wasn't maybe done on the scale that it's currently being done on. Um, you know, um, increasingly leading up to to even um, this lockdown, um, people were working from home or they were working from more than one work location. Um, there are statistics out there that suggest that, that we weren't all in the same office nine to five um, all the time. Um, and so socially really is designed to ensure that there is some, some alleviation, I suppose, of any social isolation that um, comes with remote working, working from home or being away from the workplace for a particular period of time um, where you might crave that connection. Um, in what's actually happened with the, with coronavirus, COVID-19, is that actually socially has become a lot more of a play space. Um, we've got some terrific supporters um, and essentially what Socially does is run virtual events through Facebook and Facebook Live, for example. So we've got a number of amazing supporters who have come onto Socially and are paying it forward and running free events through Facebook Live, uh, uh, competitions. We've got yoga workouts. We've got bar, bar A, if you'd like to be Scotty Morrison. <laughs> um, and we've got, we've got pet competitions, um, all designed really to get people to get people into a community, into a social community. Um, people can do this in groups of work colleagues or they can do it as we have been through this period of time, open to the public. So we've been just putting it out there. Um, it's introducing small businesses to, to audiences that they never would have previously reached. So for example, we've got a organization who is down in Melbourne. They're a uh, physio business down in South Bank in Melbourne there. They uh, uh, predominantly work with performing artists, so um, dancers, singers, comedians, etc. cetera. Um, and what they're doing, they're running three virtual events for us per week. And they are um, reaching people in South Australia and um, up in Queensland, obviously, just because we're doing it and we're pushing it out up here. Um, and they're at the stage of thinking, right, well, when this finishes, there will still be people working from home. There will still be people who are traveling who will want to do this remotely. So socially, we haven't, we're not doing it yet, but we're on the uh, on the verge of launching when this is over, how we might monetize that for those businesses so that they can keep having somebody pay for um, their virtual bar class. They've got a fabulous instructor on a Friday who I love. I'll follow him. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it's, I mean, obviously it's solving a problem, but it's also a great deal of fun as well. Well, to be honest, it was it was something, it aligns very well with Advancer and the whole um, tech platform. So it aligned with our values anyway, which is, you know, we don't we don't have to come in and sit with you and, and do everything with you if you're a business. We can actually do it virtually. You can actually have virtual HR and virtual support. Um, we've got very good platforms for it now. 
but um, it's doing it's done a great thing for us because otherwise I think we would have been sitting through this lockdown thinking what are we going to do and heaven forbid we might homeschool our children um, but so it's given us something to do but it's also the feedback that we've had from you know the general public who have participated in some of these events um, we have the virtual dog show or the virtual pet show that I've talked about before um, that went on at the very beginning of these this period the comments around you know thank you for running an event that relieves such boredom or provides us with creativity etc and bearing in mind as I said at the beginning these businesses that are our supporters who are running these things are, are really paying it forward and doing it for free we've got people who are um, you know um, we had a caption the photograph competition they could win free um uh, I think it was about two hundred dollars worth of vouchers for shoes and wallets. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, goodwill going into the here from from the our supporters. Definitely, and I'll mm. I'll share the the details for socially in the show notes. Perfect. Um, and I think as well there is a lot of pushing things forward at the moment, which is such a, a delight to see that so many people and and companies are are willing to do that. What is a difficult time yeah. uh, for people? And I think and, what what I have noticed as well is that um, because everyone's moving at such a pace. I mean, we put this up. This is seven weeks old. This socially, as of you know, two days ago, um, people are very forgiving as well because we're moving at such a pace that if something actually isn't perfect, that's okay. You know. Whereas I think before we went into this, if something wasn't perfect, it might not necessarily have have flown so well. Yeah, I think everybody's finding their feet um, hmm. and people are less judgmental, Absolutely. definitely, in, in a lot of what of things you do, which actually bring you mentioned. Uh, and I think we're being much more accepting of working and schooling from home. Yes. Which you wrote a, a really fabulous blog uh, last week uh, that I read. But what advice would yours be about how people can best combine working from home and schooling from home? Uh, and that will depend on what personality little profiles you've got in your in your uh, home. But um, one of the things that we've done here, we've got two kids that we've set up working from home here. Um, and, and a couple of the key things that we've actually asked for them to do, and there will be a blog that's going out in a couple of days around this, is around um, getting themselves psychologically, I suppose, set up to, to work. Um, so one is getting them into a routine. So just because they are at home, they still have breakfast by a particular time. They're still sitting down. They've had a shower. They've brushed their teeth by a particular time. We try and get lunch time at a particular time. Interestingly, both of ours are at two separate times. So <laughs> that's OK, just to add to the fun. Um, and they obviously finish at, at the same time and then go out for a little bit of, of exercise or something. The second is we've got them set up. So they've got a particular spot in the house that they go that is dedicated to their schoolwork. Uh, and we've done this because, uh, you know, rolling out of bed and just pulling the laptop in front of you or, or sitting on the couch would be great for your musculoskeletal system, but B actually doesn't set you up psychologically for, for learning. And the third one is is having a dress code. So uh, my daughter actually is in her school uniform. That's something that they've asked for her to do. My son um, must have clothes on is the, is, is the, <laughs> is the uh, rule that we've set. He can't have his pyjamas on. He has to get up, have a shower and, and actually have clothes on. Because all of these things things actually turn your brain and and you would know yourself if you're going to a meeting and you're in a suit and you've put your makeup on and you've done your hair you feel ready to go to your meeting if yeah. you roll up in your trackies you're probably not quite so mentally prepared so we're trying to get the kids to really mentally prepare as I said that routine that setup so they're going to the same spot and being dressed and and uh, prepared for for homeschooling so that's the kids but actually if you think about it it's exactly the same for us um, mm -hmm. not letting our um, routine be changed because we don't have the commute so we don't just check the email before we go to breakfast or before we officially start work because that can absolutely derail you if something comes through the night before that stops you having that good breakfast not sitting on the lounge where it's really easy to watch Netflix being in a study or sitting at a at a, at a spot that's your dedicated workspace you know working in your bedroom won't provide you with a great restful space the uh, the evening after the of uh, the work day if, you, if you're doing that and dressing up so you actually do feel ready for work and um and we joke uh here we've got 
you know business upstairs and party downstairs so you might be zooming with your with your with your nice top on but you've got your board shorts on the bottom that's still better than nothing well you might as well be comfortable <laughs> exactly. um, but it's all fairly simple advice but it's funny watching it in in my house that the youngest daughter who's is more of the extrovert that needs the people but she's much more routine driven now mm. so we've set up a camping table for her that's her work table. That means all her stuff is now migrating to the dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> She's taking over the yeah. place. But uh, yeah, her sister, who's a teenager, tends to hide in a room yeah. a little bit more on her MacBook. <laughs> and I think school is, yeah. is easier because they've got defined goals and um outcomes that they need to get towards the end of a day. And I think that's where the work process, so parents working from home, um, having those goals, I'm going to do two things today or three things today, um, how much productivity am I actually going to get done, having those discussions up front with your boss um, is going to be key to actually maintaining a harmonious relationship and moving forward when you have to go back to the workplace. So I think that's where schools benefit and maybe work needs a little bit more structure around it. Yeah, and it's quite, I find it's you can structure your own work day around your kids' school day Absolutely. to a certain extent. I mean, you and I are quite fortunate that our kids are of an age where they don't require too much supervision. I guess if you've got a little preppy, then it's more difficult. But so in terms of going back to the office, how will the expectations have changed, do you think, with regards to employers of their employees? So that, and that's a very interesting question. I believe that though now that we have established that we can actually work from home and that uh, a number of people are actually quite productive when they're working from home. I think this concept of working from home will actually, there will be a little bit of a hangover of it. I think there will be um, a period of it. Um, I saw, I read a um, research article where it did say that 80% of the people who were questioned in this for this article indicated that they would like to work from home more. Interestingly, more women than men, potentially because of the requirements that we have um, with, with the kids. But I think that if you do have staff who can and, wa and want to work from home and they are, have a job that will enable them to work from home, I think that might stay for a little bit of time. And then I think um, employers will need to work around what they actually need to do to help staff work from home but people have to remember that even if you're still even if you're working from home the employer is still responsible for the workplace health and safety of those employees and there are a number of checklists out there in fact there's one on our website around um, some really quick and easy ways that people can at least get a baseline of, of where they can be compliant. Um, the other thing that I think will happen, and, and we've heard premiers and, and various others talk about this, is I think there'll be flexibility in the way we actually attend the workplace, whether that might be alternate days of attendance or um, a staggered start and staggered finish, sort of more with rostered uh, arrangements. Uh, I think that's going to have to be something that's worked out with um, employers and their staff because there will be some people who are caught up in workplace arrangements who can't do that quite as flexibly as maybe others. But I think one thing's for sure, I don't think we'll be sitting having prolonged meetings in small meeting rooms. I think this Zoom, unfortunately, is here to stay for a little bit of time. <laughs> And it has its advantages and disadvantages, but um, not having to do a daily commute be just a benefit in itself. Absolutely. Obviously. And, and uh, as we spoke about before, uh, you might find that those people who really do draw their energy from being by themselves might put their hand up to say, actually, I find I'm far more productive at home. That's not to say that they want to be there five days a week. But I know that a, a number of people personally, I know a number of people who uh, work five days a week, but are in the office, only three of them. Um, and they find that a yeah. really great balance. I reckon personally, I would probably go back to work. Um, I really do get my energy from others. I reckon my entire family, the dog's going to be horrified when we all go back to work. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I think, I think it, working from home will work for people and businesses. So um, a lot of your clients are, are tech yes. startups. 
In terms of developing and maintaining culture with them, uh, particularly during rapid growth phases, what what would you uh, recommend from from that perspective? So the biggest, uh, I mean, tech is tech's interesting because of the type of personality that tends to go there. And again, I'm I'm generalizing here, so apologies to your listeners. Um, But the number one indicator of a good organizational culture or climate is trust. I I did a lot of work in um, staff surveys back in the day, um, and trust was the number one. And the way you build trust is communication. And so invariably, the difficulty when tech companies in particular grow is that the communication isn't necessarily quite as robust or as, as it as it could be and a number of people um, who are in these businesses I mean I have walked into an organization once that was a, a tech company and they were all sitting around a massive room all with their headphones on um, and when I said how does communication they said yeah we communicate we really communicate well and I said but it's silent in here and they're like no no we're all on slack check this out so that's how they're communicating. (laughs) Um, Whereas as a HR person, I sit there and say, well, if you just ask people to look at you for five seconds, you could probably get the same message across and everyone would hear the same thing. And there are opportunities for questions. And then you could follow it up on Slack and it would be done far more efficiently. So however you're going to communicate, face-to-face I find is always the best one to maintain culture. I find that if you're using face-to-face, you're building the rapport, um, people are less likely to make stuff up in the absence of any information that's not forthcoming. That's going to be absolutely key as we move back into coming out of lockdown from from here about what's going to happen, how our businesses are going to actually function, um, just as it was absolutely key as we went in. I mean, essentially, businesses are going to be judged into the future on how they actually manage return and this culture now okay. um, but the number one one um, advice that I would give anybody is is to get the communication right as you're scaling absolutely and it's about how people are treated yes. now is whether they stay in the future and also you know, when people are looking to go at different companies to work for a good question will be to ask how did you treat your staff during this period absolutely Absolutely. Um, and I think I think increasingly um, what this has done is reset everybody's values almost um, in that you sit there and go, actually, I, I didn't enjoy the rush that that was my life before this happened. And and actually, if I'm going to be away from my family, actually, people, um, you know, are going to say if I'm going to be away from my family, I want to be with an organization that I enjoy being with. And again, it's that communication, you know, um, walking in saying, right, everyone's back on Monday and you've all got to be in at nine and you're all leaving at five with no discussion probably won't go down as well as somebody just giving a quick call to say, hey, what are your circumstances? Are you back? Because remembering that whilst the schools are going back, um, the preppies, year ones and 11s and 12s on the 11th of May and hopefully the rest on the 25th, she says, touching every single bit of wood that she can possibly see because that's where mine are. Not everybody will be comfortable going back straight away. There will still be immunocompromised people. There still will be people who, um, for whatever reason, can't or shouldn't get their kids back. Then there will be people who just don't want to get their kids back. Um, And the government's already come out, I saw in the papers, and said that um, parents who don't send their children back unless they are immunocompromised, et cetera, uh, the education system won't be responsible for teaching them. It will be a very interesting discussion with an employer um, when when the economy is back on track again as to whether or not somebody actually doesn't want to send their child back to school and therefore remains at home. That's very interesting. I wasn't aware um, of that from a, the education. Career mail, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I'm not overly concerned because once the, they're allowed to go back and it's deemed safe, uh, my kids will be going back yes, as well. Yes, mine will too. <laughs> um, I've enjoyed having them, but um, it, I think it's time for everyone. Is that virtual wine getting Uh, earlier and earlier in the day? (laughs) 
<laughs> not quite. <laughs> what was the, the one about um, there were two kids that were caught in a fight and the teacher was yeah. for drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Um, anyway, well, thank you very much for sharing all your insights, Kerry. Is there anything else that you'd particularly like to oh, share? Look, since the beginning of um, this lockdown, I suppose, um, at Advancer, we've said that um, business can contact us for 15 minutes of free uh, HR consultation. And that can be anything from, hey, what does my workforce need to look like when I get back to, is my contract appropriate? Um, so people are more than welcome. I'll send the link out that can be included with this podcast. Just reach out, have a chat, 15 minutes. We'd love to talk to you. That's perfect. Well, I'll include that link in the show notes. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks for having me. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. If you're looking for career advice, your next career opportunity or to grow your tech team, then please call me, Nicholas Steele, on 499 773 546 or go to our website, jjptalent.com.au. The Don't Just Survive, Thrive podcast is part of the Spotlight series, which includes the YouTube channel, Spotlight on Software Development. If you want more insights into the software industry, particularly tech startups, then subscribe to the Spotlight on Software Development YouTube channel. Thank you for listening. Until next time. <laughs>